For early Christians, the visit of the Magi was another sign that light was dawning in the darkness. But there is something more to the visit of the Magi. These men were all pagans. They were all heathen Gentiles. They had no connection with the Jewish people, with their prophets, with their hopes, or with their Messiah. And yet, according to our gospel lesson for today, they come from a distant land to pay homage to Mary's child. And this is important because from the very beginning, Jesus is worshiped by shepherds and angels, by commoners and royalty, and perhaps more importantly, by Jews and Gentiles, by people who were not Jewish. From the very beginning, the light that dawned with the birth of Jesus was a light that shines for all people. Though we don't really know what to make of this season of Epiphany, Right? In a very real sense, everything about our faith is a celebration of Epiphany, right? It's, it, Christianity is all about Christ. It's all about Jesus being revealed in our actions, in other people's actions, about God at work in the world. It's like every day is Epiphany or has the possibility of Epiphany. And that word Epiphany literally means revealing. It is that taking away of the veil that covers something. Epiphany is about unveiling what the season of Advent promises, right? Of what all we promised before Advent, the hope, peace, joy, and love. This is that moment when we unveil it to the world. During this time of year, we read stories about Jesus' life that show Jesus revealed, that reveal him as the light that was coming into the darkness. And that is why we celebrate Epiphany. It's a time to remind ourselves that in Jesus, a light has dawned, a light has come on, a star has shone that will never go out a light of faith and hope and joy and love and peace. It's a light that shines in all the many types of darkness that inhabit our world. And that was also the purpose of our children's story this morning. It's not just a cute little time of, of, a, of a little cutout star above different things in the sanctuary, but it's a reminder to our children and us alike, that Christ is indeed present in our midst, especially in our need shining in the darkness. And so I find myself thinking of those wise men, of those magi, of those kings, and I find myself wondering about what stirred in their hearts to compel them to risk so much to leave their homes and their families and make this long, dangerous journey across territories to a country that was where they were strangers and where it was not their religion at all. What, what deep yearning for something other than what they had known led them to travel so far? And as I think of them, I find myself thinking about all of us and wondering about the journeys that we have taken and what it is that makes those journeys possible or even necessary, preferable even, to simply living the life that is right before us. What sign in the sky, what communication from God would make me go that deep, that far, to discover its meaning for me? Well, in my case, in Debbie's case, we traveled to Malawi. Whisperings from God through a newspaper article, through other people. We felt led and called to God, and then that changed everything. And it strikes me that those travelers to Bethlehem were simply living their lives out to their natural conclusions. Apparently their life's work was about studying the stars. And when they saw a star which seemed to hold so much meaning, 
all they could do if they were going to remain true to who they were, right, studiers of stars, then all they could do was to follow its direction, its calling. So having studied the stars, having felt the prodding of one particular star to take this particular journey, and then when they came to the place which the star led them, it was there that they encountered God. We know that this could not have been what they necessarily expected, at least not a God in the form and circumstance before them, a baby in a poor household. And it may well have been true that things for them were never quite the same after that, and perhaps in ways that were not all that pleasant. They did have to leave by another road after all. Still, in that baby, in that moment, they met the Holy One, God's own Son. And all they were doing was what they believed they were called to do. And yet, at the same time, this was probably more than what they had bargained for when they first started out. When they were packing up their things to travel to far-flung places, this idea of meeting a baby in a mother's arms in a poor house in a backwater town was probably not what they signed up for. Indeed, in what they had set out on here and what they experienced in and through this journey, there was a whole lot more for them now than sitting in a quiet, familiar place, taking notes on parchment and sharing their learnings with others. No, they had ridden and walked a long way. And they still had the journey home. And perhaps this is so for all of us. As we use and develop the gifts that God has planted within us, as we become all too aware of who we were made to be, with our hearts and our eyes wide open, perhaps we too will encounter God as well on our journeys. And yet there must be a point There must be a point when we follow God's leading out of our most comfortable places in order that we encounter the Holy One as well. And it could be that it might not look like we thought it would, might not feel like we thought it would, but perhaps it is within the surprise itself that God is present. Because God seems to do whatever it takes to reach out to us and to embrace all people. God announces the birth of the Messiah to shepherds through angels on Christmas, to magi via a star on Epiphany, and to the political and religious authorities of God's own people through visitors from the East from a manger where a child lies wrapped in bands of cloth god's reach god's embrace in jesus gets bigger and bigger and bigger jesus eats with outcasts and sinners jesus touches people who are sick and people who live with disabilities jesus even calls the dead back to life Ultimately, Jesus draws all people to himself as he is lifted up on the cross. In Jesus, no one is beyond God's embrace. God's radical grace is wondrously frightening. I experience a bit of that as I shudder when I think about the implications of portraying the Magi as scientists who practiced another religion because to do so pushes me to expand my understanding of the way that God reaches out to people to announce good news and what it means for individuals to have faith and for gatherings of the faithful in church. Because the Magi did not come looking for Christ through preaching or liturgy or sacraments or a welcoming congregation or a vital social ministry, all of those things that I hold dear. No, they came seeking Christ after studying the night skies. As someone who holds on to favorite and cherished ways, 
the, the traditional ways that we think that God works, to proclaim the gospel, to bring people to faith, it's always wondrously frightening to realize anew that God's own work of embracing all people is more mystery than formula because God's ways are always so much bigger than my ways and my understanding. It's much safer to stand up here and spend the sermon time reverently and sentimentally discussing the three wise men and reading meaning into the number and the kind of gifts that they bring. If you think about it, it's even in the difference of what we call them. Do we call them the three wise men or the not so traditional magi, a reminder of the mystery. Yet, if I am honest with myself, God is always reaching out to embrace me in new ways. And this year, as I have been thinking about Epiphany and the texts associated with this, with this day, I have been reflecting on the popular use of the word Epiphany, just like in the children's story and Homer Simpson's dull moment. And so instead of going to a theological dictionary, I went to the most popular source of information that I know of, Wikipedia. And there I found an article that defined epiphany as a feeling. To quote Wikipedia, generally the term is used to describe scientific breakthrough, religious or philosophical discoveries, defined earlier as experiences of sudden and striking realization, but it can be apply but it can apply in any situation in which an enlightening realization allows a problem or situation to be understood from a new and deeper perspective the church celebrates epiphany as the sudden realization of not just the magi but of all disciples of christ in any age in every age the realization that Jesus is the physical manifestation of God, Emmanuel, God with us. And so today, I want us to think about recent epiphanies in our own lives. Those times when we have suddenly realized that not only is Jesus the physical manifestation of God, but that God, through Jesus, has been present with you is present with you, and will be present with you, always. And I'll go first, if it makes it any easier. I've always found it really awkward when people come up to me after a funeral service and thank me, when they say, great sermon, or good service. It's not that I doubt their sincerity, but as I have thought about it, I realize that I find it awkward because in many ways, it is simply part of my job. And being thanked or praised for summing up someone's life makes me uncomfortable. Another thing that I find awkward is being thanked by someone who is really sick or dying. Thanks for the visit, Reverend. Again, it's not a question of depth or sincerity of their thanks. It's about my own discomfort. And again, it's part of the job. And if you really want to be callous about it, I get paid to visit you. But I had an epiphany a number of years ago that in hindsight had been building for a little while. I'd spent a lot of time with Kevin and Linda over a year and a half period. Kevin had hepatitis C and his liver was failing. He was palliative and he became weaker and weaker and for a while he became angrier and angrier until finally he was admitted to the hospital because he could no longer be cared for at home. And as I was finishing one of my final visits with Kevin at his bedside in the hospital, as I was saying my goodbyes, he reached over and he gripped my hand and he looked deeply in my eyes and he thanked me. And I remember feeling humbled, but I also remember feeling really embarrassed. And, and I know I mumbled something as I left, but since then I have come to the realization, the epiphany, that Kevin was thanking God, not me. He was thanking God for God's presence, 
a presence partially personified by my visits. But Kevin was really thanking God, not me. And I found myself thanking God too for that epiphany and for the realization and the burden that God is with me in those moments and that I am living into what God has made me for. As I was planning this morning's children's story and thinking about where we find God in our midst, but where that star is, the first thing that popped into my mind was in that hospital room with Kevin. I kind of need that star, right, to be with me in my visit to remind me and Kevin or remind me and whoever I'm visiting, God's here in our midst. Friends, God is in our midst every day, everywhere. Just as the star led the Magi to Jesus in Bethlehem, so Epiphany can help us. It can help us to unveil and acknowledge that God is indeed in our midst. Amen. Our hymn, number 712, Arise, Your Light is Come, sung by Marianne McVicker. <laughs> 